So, David Novakovic, um, here to talk about Twisted, particularly in a in-flight entertainment system. Um, what I will be talking about is largely its use as a controller in the system and less so about the specific firmware and stuff in the network that it's controlling. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I was a, essentially a contractor on this project. It's, we went for about two years um, with lots of delays and all that kind of stuff. I'd like to say it wasn't my fault. Um, and uh, yeah, and so now I actually work um, at scrunch.co, where a um, business of business, uh, business intelligence platform for the fashion industry. So um, I do like really strange embedded stuff and really big, uh, big data stuff. So. I guess technically I'm more of a data scientist than anything else. Um, so this was a really nice project, um, unusual thing to work on. Um, the owner of DigiCore has been really um, great with this and has basically said talk about whatever you want to talk about. So if you have any interesting questions at the end, please don't hesitate to ask. Even though the product itself is not open source, it's built on open source tech and the company is quite open about how it does things. So, um, I've been told I'm not supposed to swear, so WTF is twisted. Um, the actual devices that are on the, uh, the in-flight entertainment system network and the system requirements that um, helped us arrive at the solution that we came to and a bunch of code examples to hopefully make twisted not seem as crazy as people seem to think it is. Um, <coughs> so, I, I don't know how many times I've had people jump onto IRC or something and say, you know, what should I be, uh, what should I be using to build my IRC bot or my, I want to do something simple with a socket server, what should I use? And the answer is inevitably, use Twisted. And then, you know, about half an hour later, you can kind of time it, they come back in and go, I've got no idea what this thing is, I, I don't know where to start, um, the documentation's really bad, blah, blah, blah. So. Um, it's, it is a big project and hopefully I can kind of add some simplicity to it today. Um, it's really more like a, like a Swiss Army knife, so it um, can be a bit hard to know where to start sometimes. So what is Twisted? Anyone here actually used Twisted before? Cool. So Twisted, anyone here not know what Twisted is? Alright, awesome. So we all know it's an event-driven framework for Python. It has a large suite of networking protocols. Um, and when I say networking, I mean anything that's kind of I.O. based. So um, HTTP um, and all the way down, uh, right down to TunTap and um, UDEV and things like that. So uh, the reason um, it was interesting for us is because we're hardware constrained um, and we need to deal with a lot of um, seats out in a in a plane, like uh, a network of say 300 nodes, um, all constantly in communication with this central kind of control. So um, I've got I actually brought some of the hardware along today. This is my dev setup for the player um, device that this goes into a seat, and it has the uh, seat disconnect underneath it here, which is a uh, an FAA requirement um, that disconnects the screen from the rest of the electronics in the plane. So there's a lot of like uh, sort of certification overhead and all that kind of stuff that goes along with building these things. Um, so um, yeah, and also Twisted actually has a fairly consistent API when, once you understand what it's actually doing. Um, and I had a, uh, one thing that was important for us was Python was already chosen before I joined the project. So there was a bit of kind of synchronous legacy there. Um, it was nice to be able to use a thread pool. And um, other really nice things that Twisted has is all the kind of locking primitives that you would hope to have in a concurrent system. Uh, one thing that I think is overlooked a lot is the application framework in Twisted, which is a really nice way of being able to compose services um, of all different shapes and sizes into a single Python process in a kind of semi-declarative way. Um, it has support for unit testing, synchronous code, um, including being able to manipulate time and stuff like that, uh, which makes your tests run faster. 
And of course it integrates with all of the big event loops. Um, there's more there, but I couldn't really think of them off the top of my head. And it has some nice third party libraries that are popping up that are making it easier to do things. Like Klein, which is great um, as a Sinatra style web tool. Cyclone, Shrek, which is essentially like a copy of the Kenneth Reitz's um, request library. And Ampule, which is like a, a process pool. Um, so I won't go on too much about what Twisted can do and more talk about what we did with it. So um, this is actually a, an image, uh, this is from a trade show with the, the full setup uh, running in a bunch of seats on the trade show floor. Um, the, way it, the way it works is, um, make sure I'm, yeah, so it, it's more of a distributed system. So traditionally with uh, in-flight entertainment systems, you would have kind of dumb screens in the seats and they would essentially receive uh, a buttload of streaming data from a centralized server. So in planes, um, you know, you have these like cabinets with uh, a full rack pretty much of servers sitting in it to stream media and all the other bits and pieces out to the seat. So um, these systems are really expensive. Um, I think they're maybe around the 20 grand per seat mark and uh, require these very heavy server setups. So um, the other problem with this is you kind of need to upgrade them all at once if you're going to upgrade them. And a lot of the times um, when these systems get upgraded, it's more um, regulatory overhead to remove all the cabling and stuff than it is to leave it in there. So these planes continuously have these cables and cables left in them um, until it gets to the point where they're using so much fuel flying this copper around in the sky that it's better off for them to actually pull the cable out and they pull it all out in one go. This system is meant to be kind of modular, so it's um, all the ethernet through the plane and, and the power is over the ethernet. Um, means that players can be swapped in and out and replaced when they're faulty and stuff. And um, the server part of it can be uh, upgraded too. And the server itself is about the size of this box. Um, so, yeah, the idea is to create a sort of modular system. So um, to do that, we use all the kind of things that you would expect to see, like um, proper ethernet and, um, yeah, it, it, there, there, I mean, that is simplifying a little bit. There are things like, I think I'm about to talk about it. Yeah, so the players, um, this little unit here, and I can open it up if anyone wants to have a look inside it later um, at the disconnect. Um, the triple redundant power supplies, so the switches on the network are also the uh, failover power supplies for the whole system. So um, with the triple redundant power supplies, you can have two uh, power supplies conk out through it within, a, within a three uh, power supply region in the plane and still be able to use USB power and stuff at your seat. So uh, the idea is that it's very reliable. And, um, and the controller itself, the little server I mentioned, um, is a dual core Atom actually running Ubuntu and, um, and it has a bunch of like uh, embedded um, Stellaris uh, microprocessors attached to it as well that are doing various things on the network um, and interfacing directly with the hardware on the plane. So, of course, there's a bunch of uh, FAA questions around that sort of stuff. So, uh, the server is actually the touch screen for the cabin crew to use as well. So, that would just be up in the cabin area and they can uh, control the whole system from there. As well as, um, that's where the uh, MSATA hard drives and everything live inside that as well um, with the content on them. And the power unit is the thing down the bottom, which is also the Ethernet switch. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry about this slide. I was finishing this off at 2 o'clock this morning. <laughs> um, um, I just wanted to list all of the kind of interesting things in the project in one place. So, um, the system, the central server where my, my software was running, uh, was essentially controlling this network of nodes using a multicast, so a binary protocol over multicast. Um, the multicast uh, and the interactions, 
uh, so when these seats would receive a multicast uh, event, they would then poll back with a HTTP request back to the central node to make as an acknowledgement and to update any required information. So um, there was obviously uh, like a, a crypto secure handshaking process there to make sure that malicious nodes on the network couldn't do strange things. Um, so there's a fair bit of uh, state contained in this kind of two-way communication. Um, we had to do things like listen to which audio stream is active on, a, um, on all of the audio obviously gets sent to one place for say the cabin crew using the microphone or the pilot using the microphone or the in-flight entertainment system or the background music when you're boarding the plane or uh, let's say decompression happens. All of that stuff essentially is audio that needs to be played through the cabin. And part of that uh, is that it's broadcast out onto the network uh, as a multicast stream of data and um, we're sort of essentially um, snooping that traffic uh, to make sure that we've got the right speakers enabled and we pause, say, the cabin crew is playing the boarding message as you come onto the plane and then the, the pilot picks up the microphone and starts talking. We need to like pause the, the boarding video and let the because the pilot has the highest priority and uh, all that sort of stuff and there's multiple layers of that so you could be playing a video and then the cabin crew could pick something the microphone up and then the pilot could pick the microphone up so um, and then there's also feedback back to the pilots as well like um, letting them know that there's actually a video playing so before they pick up the microphone they can go oh wait they're, they're playing a video in the in the in the cabin so uh, all of that stuff is interfaced via um, direct connections to the hardware in the plane um, via a microcontroller Let's just say it was Arduino. It wasn't. It was um, Texas Instruments, but same diff. Um, and and uh, and uh, yeah, and a lot of uh, kind of network communications as well. So um, there is actually oh, I won't say that now. <laughs> but there is a bit of legacy that needed to run in the thread pool as well. Um, and of course, the timing on these things is really important. So the FAA has like specific timing thresholds where you need to be able to respond to particular events happening and play, say if a decompression happens, you need to be playing the decompression um, warning message basically as soon as possible. So there's um, some very sort of, well, I mean, they're not very tight, but there are some strict timelines about that sort of stuff. The other things we needed to do was like, um, the actual survey, it's a shame I couldn't bring one today. The uh, cabin crew can actually say that the plane's parked at a gate, the cabin crew can come in with a USB key with like the, that day's news or something on it and plug it into the device. and it will acknowledge the fact that that's a new content set and distribute it out to all of the nodes on the network. So there's also like a content server aspect to this. Um, and we also need to not let um, cabin crew just put their USB full of porn into the front of the device and stuff like that. So um, there's a bit of like uh, UDEV level enabling and disabling of, U of USB devices. <coughs> um, what else we got? Um, the kiosk, of course, it's a touch screen. You could just plug a keyboard into the front USB plug. So um, the front USB plugs don't accept keyboard input unless you've put in a pin through the user interface. Um, and uh, of course, if you're not in like the kind of maintenance mode, we lock down all the control keys and meta keys and all that sort of stuff. So that's literally this process um, calling XMOD map uh, in, a, in a sub shell. <laughs> um, and other interesting things is these planes um, don't have an internet connection in the air, a lot of them. So these are like second and third tier airlines that so they don't have the, the top tier gear yet. So uh, the only time that we can talk to them is when they're actually landed and at a gate. So when the plane's at a gate, I hear that the cargo doors open and the wheels are down. So then I know the plane's at a gate. Um, and I try and, uh, the microcontroller switches on the USB modems, try and get out to the web. And if I can, then I'll check for new content um, upload any server logs and stuff from the server and um, do any syncing like that. And the way um, the maintenance team gets access to this device is that at gate it creates a reverse uh, tunnel SSH connection out to a known server and people can access the, uh, access the device that way. Um, and once they're actually shelled into the machine, um, 
they can inspect the running twisted process by using this thing called manhole, which is essentially twisted's way of giving you a telnet connection where you can shell into your running process and inspect whatever memory is available and all that sort of stuff. So um, it looks like a Python terminal. You can use variables and everything like a Python terminal, so it's quite nice. Uh, and the other thing that we needed to run was a TFTP server uh, because all of the devices on the network um, need to be able to, this is how they're, um, they're set up, is that they fetch their firmware from a TFTP server at a particular address. So all of this stuff was running in a single Python process, except for the XMOD map stuff. <laughs> um, so it's um, nice to be able to pull together all of these different aspects of a project into a single code base and even process. Um, the one other thing I didn't mention here is the, there is a streaming, um, oh yeah, I did, uh, the streaming VLC, um, which is used to do a lot of the, um, some other types of messages to do with the cabin crew and stuff. Um, VLC, I, I didn't really realize this at the time, but um, VLC actually has a Telnet interface, so our twisted code um, connects to the Telnet interface, interface programmatically and parses the, um, the command line input from tel this Telnet interface and controls the player and fetches like where it's up to in a piece of media and all that sort of stuff back from VLC itself. Um, so <laughs> they're all the different bits and pieces and there's a lot there, way too much for us to go through today considering I have I have 15, less than 15 minutes, so, um, so I'll just go through some code of how these bits and pieces are set up. Um, I realised this morning that I've managed to set up all of the example code without using any deferreds, which is really strange for Twisted. So I guess Twisted has, this, has two concepts of kind of asynchronous um, callbacks. One is a protocol which is literally like, uh, oh, this is a protocol for sending multicast data out onto the network and um, because we don't necessarily know when we're going to receive our next event we have like callbacks and established interface where as datagram, uh, as packets come off the network we receive them and can operate on them. And then the second kind of asynchronous stuff that Twisted does is deferred, which is kind of like a promise. Um, and um, that's more about a, a request response style asynchronous programming. So um, less so about some random event can come in off a network or something. So because I'm talking about the services that I used, I actually don't really touch on deferreds at all, which is probably a good thing actually. <laughs> Um, so obviously multicast, very simple. You could pass in a, um, you know, you could construct this object with a reference to your kind of central controller code and um, dispatch um, events that are coming in off the network that way. Um, interestingly, um, most of what we use the multicast stuff for is actually sending out broadcasts. So you can see the self.transport.write is just writing some data out to a particular multicast group. Um, HTTP is a really big thing, so there's, there's HTTP is used in two places. Um, the nodes responding to a multicast event and, um, and also uh, for the actual user interface that runs on the, on the device and the user interface is just a, a backbone um, JavaScript application, which uh, I didn't develop, so I haven't really mentioned in this. <laughs> um, ignore the HTML rendering artifact down the bottom there. But basically, this is using Klein, which is a really nice uh, uh, HTTP framework, if you want to call it, like Flask and Sinatra and stuff. I've actually got it set up in not the Flask Sinatra style, just a function that returns some kind of data. I've actually got it set up as a class so that I can store, store some state on it. Um, in this case, I wanted to store a reference to the kind of central controller code that holds all of the information about the network that's currently running. Um, but yeah, it really is quite a beautiful little tool to use, as you would expect from something that 
likens itself to um, Sinatra or Flask. Um, I'm going to try and get through this quickly so I can answer any questions. Um, the serial port, okay, so serial port, I think the key thing with these, anyone who's not familiar with Twisted, the key thing about what I want to get across here is that these protocol things all kind of look the same. Like, if you want to do network or asynchronous stuff in Twisted and you want to be able to re deal with callbacks and whatever, the protocol is where that happens. So, um, once you kind of understand how the protocols fit into your application, then it becomes very easy to reason about um, the composition of these different protocols. Most people, I guess, would only care about a HTTP um, protocol, for example, or one particular protocol at a time. I had to care about a lot of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, using the only dependency of this one outside of Twisted is actually the um, PySerial library but um, mostly this is just twisted code and a little helper to um, connect to the actual uh, serial port device node. Um, yeah. So the key thing with a lot of these protocols is they subclass this line receiver um, protocol and that means that Essentially, Twisted is buffering this data as it's coming in off the network, and each time it sees a line and you can change the delimiter, it then calls the callback with that particular line. So if you wanted, you could just use a raw protocol that would actually just receive raw data and just give it to you as it receives it off the net, well, as it receives it from the operating system buffers. Um, line receivers mean that I don't need to care about new lines and stuff. I just need to know what to expect and set it up, and it does everything for me, which is nice. Yes, um, there is a bunch of Django code in this project. So um, the ORM is used a lot and this was something that um, was kind of there before I, I started. Um, obviously I don't have that much of a problem with Django, um, but it was a kind of an unusual thing to have to deal with. So. Um, one of the really nice things about Django was the admin interface that we had um, that was automatically generated out of our model objects. So we thought we would keep it around and actually run it inside the Twisted process as well. So the Twisted process is actually the web server that's serving the Django Whiskey application. And the way it does that is by using the Django Whiskey handler, starting a thread pool and serving the Whiskey handler from that thread pool. Pretty simple. Um, and most of the code that I used, I actually took from this, uh, this project, which is just an example of hooking Whiskey and um, Django and, and Twisted together. Um, so uh, in the actual project itself, this, interface, this Django interface is only something that super users of the system can have. So the twisted process actually starts and stops this Django service as people put their um, maintenance key into the system. So we have a lot of control about which ports are being listened to and what is being listened to on those ports and all that sort of stuff so that we can secure the system. Um, my argument was like, if someone can get to the point where they're actually connecting to this port, we've got some serious problems on our network. <laughs> Um, so other things like uh, the Telnet um, protocol for connecting to VLC Telnet, um, a protocol for listening to UDEV events, um, and a bunch of, uh, of things like other protocols like that. Uh, the, um, the manhole um, thing, the Telnet being able to tell that into our running twisted process, that is about all the code you need to do it, as long as you don't mind using my user and a password as your username and password. Um, the namespace thing here is probably the most interesting bit. That is uh, sort of creating the, the scope that will be available to someone who telnets into the process. So you telnet in and you have a variable in the global scope called service. And in this case, that would have been the instance of our central kind of uh, server class. Hmm. So, one thing I haven't really touched on um, beyond just saying that it exists is the application framework in Twisted. So this is the this is the thing that takes 
this service, this service, whatever, uh, you know, that JSON RPC interface or XML RPC interface, web server, um, the multicast listener, um, and ties them all together in one place. Uh, so to do that, um, by, by, by setting things up properly in Twisted, we can actually use the Twisted command line tool, which is like a, a demonizing way, a way of running your Twisted process. Um, it can demonize itself or not. Uh, it sets up a PID file or not. Uh, it sets up all the logging stuff for you, and it kind of has this, you would have seen it in heaps of other servers where if an error happens, it doesn't kill the whole process. It just kind of prints it out and lets you deal with it. Um, an error that you don't handle. Uh, and I've included a link there to um, some of the basic stuff about Twisted. Um, so, Twisted, the command line tool, Twisted D, Twist D, whatever, um, what it does is it runs a service. And as far as Twisted is concerned, is a service that listens to HTTP or a service that is a collection of other services are basically the same thing. So. Um, all it cares about is that it gets given a service that has a start service method and a stop service method. Um, so, and it can compose any number of these services together. So, um, I'm using the for the for the uh, for the client web interface. I'm actually using the HTTP. Uh, service that's provided by Twisted, which is why that looks a little bit different. I didn't need to define it myself. And finally, I'll only skip over this briefly, but this is basically the, this service maker um, variable at the bottom here is basically what Twisted needs. When you run this command line here, um, it looks for the IOTC um, plugin and can run it with the arguments that have been provided. And with Twisted, you can select your um, a, a, a synchronous loop implementation as well. I won't go into the unit testing too much. Basically, Twisted has a way of unit testing where you can return deferred events from a unit test, which kind of breaks the whole pi unit pattern of not returning anything, but in this case, you actually need to do it so that you can get the result from the deferred later. Um, yeah, hopefully, man, that was fast. Um, <laughs> hopefully, that gives you the tools to do what you need to do um, or at least places to go and look for interesting things if you want to control a large kind of Internet of Things network in Twisted. Um, and also Digicore, the company that makes this device, is hiring. So uh, if, you, if this looks like something you'd like to work on, they've got offices in Brisbane and Utah. So um, yeah, swing them an email. Um, the end. Thank you. <laughs>